get started with the webinar today. Good morning, afternoon, or evening, everyone. I would like to welcome you to today's AgriLinks webinar on the burgeoning technical networks for the Comprehensive Ag Africa Agricultural Development Program, or CADEP. AgriLinks webinars are a product of the USA Bureau for Food Security and are implemented by the Knowledge Driven Agricultural Development Project. My name is Julie McCarty, and I'm a Knowledge Management Specialist with the USAID Bureau for Food Security, and I'll be facilitating the webinar today. So you'll see my name in the chat box a fair amount and hear my voice during the question and answer session after the presentation. Before we get started with the content, I'd like to provide just a few reminders about the structure of the webinar today. Uh, first up, the chat box is your main way to communicate today, and I can see that a lot of people have already introduced yourself in the chat box, which is fantastic. Uh, it's great to see that we have people joining from uh, all around the world, so please do continue to introduce yourselves um, and let us know where you're joining from. Uh, throughout the webinar, we encourage you to use the chat box to network, to share links and resources, and of course to ask questions about the presentations that we will gather um, and sort and pose to our speakers in the second half of the webinar today. Uh, next, I wanted to let you know that the PowerPoint or a PDF of the PowerPoint of today's presentation is available in that resources box you'll see on the left of your screen. Uh, in addition to a whole range of, of various uh, resources that our presenters have recommended. So you can see one of them is titled Webinar Presentation if you would like to go ahead and uh, download the PowerPoint uh, during the presentation today. Uh, we also wanted to let you know that we are recording this webinar and we will post the recording, the transcript, and the other resources to AgriLinks uh, within about two weeks. And if you are watching the webinar right now, that means that you are already on the email list to receive a link to the recording, so be on the lookout for that. And lastly, I wanted to let you all know that this is a fairly technically complex webinar. We're actually bringing in our speakers from three different locations in Africa, which is really exciting. Um, I'm, I'm so happy we live in an era where we're able to do that sort of thing. Uh, but that does mean that there may be some audio issues that we might need to work through to make sure our presenters uh, come to you clearly. So please just excuse us if we need to uh, take a pause at any point and uh, adjust anything with the audio. All right, so I'm going to um, go ahead and introduce our speakers today and uh, give you a, a bit of a rundown of what the structure of the presentations will look like. Our first speaker will be Godfrey Bahigua. Uh, and Godfrey will be giving some background on CADAP and the Malibu Declaration and an introduction to the CADAP technical networks, how they work, and how you participate. And Godfrey is the director of the African Union's Department for Rural Economy, based in Addis Ababa, uh, which works with AU member states, regional economic communities, and other partners to boost rural economic development and agricultural productivity um, by supporting the adoption of measures, strategies, policies, and programs on agriculture. So Godfrey will be our first speaker, and he'll be speaking for uh, about 30 minutes or so. Uh, next up will be Jeff Hill. And uh, Jeff has many years of experience in African agricultural development and is currently uh, serving in the USAID Bureau for Food Security, where he's been, um, uh, at, at USAID he's been a team leader for a number of agriculture and food security initiatives for the Africa Bureau and for BFS. And um, he's now serving as chair of the CADAP Development Partners Group, which is the primary platform for donor and assistance coordination at the continental level. So Jeff will further explain CADAP's technical support needs and the role of donors. And he'll be going for about 10 minutes. And then after that, we'll have uh, short remarks from two additional individuals, uh, one being uh, Chris Muyunda, who is Vice President of the CADAP Non-State Actors Coalition, CNC, and CADAP Technical Networks Mentor. And he's a leading agribusiness strategy and development specialist. So he'll be giving an example of one of the seven CADAP Technical Networks and its progress to date. And then last but not least, uh, Greenwell Machaya will be joining us. He is a researcher and the coordinator for the Regional Strategy Analysis and Knowledge Support System, uh, RESAX, for the Southern Africa region. And he'll be providing uh, some final reflections on the presentations today. Uh, so again, uh, please do feel free to put your questions in the chat box at any time. Uh, let us know if you're having any issues with the audio, and uh, we'll jump right into the presentations now. Um, all right, so go ahead and please take away uh, the microphone, Godfrey. 
Okay, thank you so much, um, Yuli, for the moderation. And let me start by uh, thanking everybody that has been able to join this webinar uh, from across the globe. Uh, it's exciting to, uh, to be able to present to you um, our initiative uh, on the African continent, the African Union Commission, uh, on our efforts to, to, be, to boost capacity, uh, boosting capacity to support um, African Union member states to implement the CADAP agenda. That's what this is about, um, mobilizing technical capacity across the continent and from across the globe uh, to support the African continent to prepare itself uh, for better implementation of the agriculture agenda through the Comprehensive Africa Agriculture Development Program. So just to give you an idea what this um, webinar is all about. Uh, next slide is on the background um, to CADAP and the Malabo Declaration. Um, the CADAP agenda um, was adopted by African heads of state and government in Maputo, Mozambique, in 2003, and the main objective was to have a, a continent-wide framework to drive agricultural development, to achieve food security and nutrition, reduce poverty, and improve nutrition, and create jobs uh, for Africans. The CADAP agenda is driven by the AUC through the Department of Rural Economy and Agriculture, where I'm the director, as well as the NEPAD Planning and Connecting Agency, our sister institution, which is based in, Southern Af in South Africa. And with implementation of CADAP takes place largely at, at um, country level, uh, coordinated by AUC um, through the Regional Economic Community, with the participation of um, farmers, uh, the primary producers, other private sector actors, non-state actors, and also with the support of the government partners. Mm -hmm. The CADAP agenda, the CADAP agenda, um, the CADAP agenda, the CADAP agenda, the CADAP agenda. political support on the continent um, through the top leadership of the African Union, and it is through the continental platform, which is the African Union Summit, uh, where the highest decisions around the implementation of the CADAP are made. And so the Maputo Declaration that I talked about was adopted by the heads of state, and also the, the, the follow-on declaration, the, the Malabar Declaration, was also adopted at the highest political level. And so the agenda does have political support at all levels. Um, the Maputo Declaration uh, on CADAP um, lasted for 10 years, uh, 20, uh, 2003 to 2013, and it achieved quite a lot, and especially um, rallying the continent, uh, all AU member states, as well as the global community around a, a common framework that everybody believed would drive um, African agriculture forward. And we made significant progress in mobilizing countries to allocate um, more resources to the sector because that declaration had a call of spending at least 10% of the national budget to, into the agriculture sector. So we made a lot of progress. Not all progress, not all countries achieved that target, but a lot of rallying was made uh, uh, on that. And as a result, many countries did make progress in growing the agriculture sector, because we had a target of, of growing the sector at uh, an annual rate of 6%. But also over those 10 years, we were able to learn many lessons on what uh, did work and what did not work, on the best of which um, then the Malabo Declaration um, Hi, Godfrey. I'm sorry. This is Adam. I'm going to interrupt you. You sound great. Um, everything is going across famously. And I know you don't have a computer in front of you. There's about 135 people online. I just want to make sure that you're telling us to advance the slides if we need to. And when you do, that you tell us the title of the slide. So what slide are you on right now? 
So I'm, I'm on the yes, I'm on the slide which says the Malabo Declaration, 2015 to 2025. Okay, thank you for that, and please remember to tell us when you advance the slide and the title of the slide. Thank you. Go on. Yes. Apologies, Adam, on that. I should have done that. Yes. So, yes. So the Malabo Declaration, um, which covers a period of 2015-2025, was adopted by African heads of state and government in June 2014. So this was a follow-on declaration um, to the Maputo one. Um, having learned lessons uh, um, on cut-up implementation after 10 years, the heads of state determined that we needed to be a little bit more specific than we were for Maputo. That was one thing. The second thing is that we did spend quite a bit of time um, in the past 10 years of cut-up implementation on processes, on uh, supporting countries from late investment plans. But we realized that we needed to also um, invest now more time in developing the capacity of countries to implement those investment plans. The other unique feature around the Malabo Declaration is the emphasis that the heads of state made on strengthening accountability systems, strengthening mutual accountability towards actions and results, not processes alone. But also it emphasizes um, the need to develop capacity of African Union member states to be able to uh, implement effective uh, investment plans. Not just technical capacity, but also institutional and policy capacity at country level. So developing the same capacity to strengthen implementation so that we can have increase the chances of better outcomes through the national investment plan. Next slide. It says the seven Malabo commitments. So basically, um, as, I said, as I stated, the Malabo declaration, the heads of state decided to be a little bit more specific than they had been uh, in the Bakuto declaration. So when they adopted this declaration, uh, the first commitment was them recommitting themselves the principles of the CADAP agenda. In other words, what had motivated them to adopt the Maputo Declaration was still valid. In other words, agriculture was still important for the continent to drive the development, for food security, for poverty uh, reduction, job creation, and so on. And then they went ahead and adopted specific um, uh, commitments on enhancing uh, financing for agriculture, both public and private, uh, committing to ending hunger on the continent by 2025, uh, having the level of poverty um, of 2014 by 50%, and ensuring that as we do that through the agriculture sector, um, we do have equitable um, and broad-based growth through agricultural investment. They also committed to um, boosting intra-Africa trade, trade within Africa among African countries, among African um, regional economic communities, and the target there being uh, tripling that volume of trade. But also cognizant of the effects of uh, climate change, they committed to enhancing resilience, both of livelihoods and also the production system within which agriculture takes place. And lastly, uh, committing to uh, mutual accountability, which I said is a unique feature in the Malabo Declaration. So those are the seven commitments that are going to drive us um, within the Malabo Declaration going forward uh, from now up 2025. So next slide says AU business plan. So in trying to, um, to trans translate the commitments of the heads of state into something implementable, the heads of state uh, mandated the African Union Commission with the NEPAD planning and coordinating agencies to develop a joint business plan on how we would translate the commitment into actionable areas for implementation both by the regional economic community as well as the AU uh, member states. So the business plan, I will not get into the details of that, but the business plan has seven uh, program areas, which are directly linked to the, uh, the seven uh, Malabo commitments. 
and then the seven commit, uh, program areas are further subdivided into 36 sub, um, uh, six sub programs, and we have also developed an operational business plan. In short, this is the plan that is going to drive us, the African Union Commission, together with the NEPAD agency and the regional economic community to support AU member states to integrate the Maraba commitment into their national investment plan, allocate resources to them, implement, and then we can support the uh, um, tracking and reporting on the implementation of the Malabo Declaration to the heads of state every two years. I should have mentioned that that commitment on mutual accountability requires that AUC report to the heads of state every two years, and the first report for implementation will be due January 2018. Okay? So the next slide it says AU cut up Malabo business, Malabo programs and sub programs. You have the slides, I'm not going to go through these, but basically these are the seven um, programs of the business plan and the sub programs that we have developed under them. The next slide also says AU cut up uh, Malabo business plan. It does have um, the fifth, sixth, and seventh um, uh, programs. Uh, and, and also the sub programs under, under them. The next slide is about um, capacity as a key challenge for CADAP implementation. So this is what is now going to, I just gave you the background on how we have evolved from CADAP phase one to CADAP phase two. Now we want to specifically address the issue of capacity, which is the basis for um, the need to establish this technical network. So I already mentioned that the, um, the Malabo Declaration was adopted in 2014, and having learned lessons from the uh, Maputo Declaration. And I also did mention that one of the things that we learned um, in the past 10 years was that we needed to strengthen capacity at country level for implementation. Well, all across from um, designing a good investment plan to implementing the business plan, to evaluating the performance of the business plan, to designing corrective measures. So across the whole chain of implementing a, a business plan, we re, uh, recognize that capacity was required. And in this case, we are zeroing in on um, developing systemic capacity um, for implementing the Marabu Declaration. One thing that I, I did not uh, mention um, is that once the heads of state adopted the, the Malabo Declaration, we did develop what is called the CADAP Results Framework. In other words, um, a framework that would show how we move from the declaration to um, a, a well thought out chain uh, on how we would achieve the results. So that CADAP Results Framework has three levels. Um, level one is about building the systemic capacity for institutions, policies, uh, financing to support the, um, uh, the agriculture investment at level two, which have to do productivity, trade, uh, natural resource management, and so on. So level three of the of the results, level one of the results framework, which is about the results, uh, nutrition, uh, resilience, job, cobalt reduction, um, and so on. So. That underpins the mutual accountability mechanism that I described uh, earlier. Next slide uh, is lessons from previous efforts to provide capacity development support. So this concept of the of the second network is not new. Um, over the last ten years, we have tried several um, times and ways to um, support capacity development on the continent. Um, we have a, one such is um, a knowledge, establishing different uh, knowledge information systems at different levels. We do have success with the, the, the uh, RISAC, the Regional Strategic Analysis and Knowledge Support System. Um, and I want to get into details of that. 
But that is one effort that I think has made progress. We yeah. tried um, the, the voting no, joint action like plan. Uh, those did not go very far. Um, then we had the pillar institutions. The pillar institutions are really the precursor to this concept of the of the technical network. So basically, um, during the phase one, um, it was recognized that once countries developed their national private investment plan that had integrated the Maputo Declaration to them, we need to have a mechanism, and the Maputo Declaration had four pillars. So we need to make sure that the national investment plan had integrated these four pillars within their investment plan. And how would we do that? We needed to have an independent review of these investment plans to make sure that they are compliant to the CADAP agenda. And so pillar institutions, and the reason they were called pillar institutions is because there were four pillars, and so four uh, institutions on the continent were identified to be the lead uh, institution to review the content around each of those four pillars in the, in the national investment plan. They did uh, function, but not to the extent um, to meet the, the full expectation of the constituency. So out of that, so out of those initiatives on knowledge information systems, joint action plans, and uh, institutions, we learned some lessons um, that are now informing the development of, of this second network. So one of them was that we needed to have clarity uh, on the gaps and needs of member states. What do member states need? What are their um, capacity gaps and needs? Uh, we need to be clear on that. that for them to sustain them, we need to have adequate resources that would support the technical people that are, 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 um, are, are providing this support to countries. That also we need to be aware that we are dealing with a, a large continent, 65 um, member states as we speak, but also with different agroecological uh, systems, and therefore the needs are not the same. Um, so we need to be sensitive about that. But we also learned that um, succeed, we need to have in place strong accountability mechanisms at country level. And that is accounting both for resources that are invested as well as the, uh, the outcomes from those investments. And we also wanted to learn that we need to reduce um, the overdependency of the AU member states and rest on the AU um, uh, mechanism, but there needed to be some kind of autonomy um, uh, around this support. So these lessons have, uh, were learned over the last 10 years, and they have helped us to uh, shape the thinking around how to shape these technical networks for supporting the implementation of the um, Marabu Declaration. Next slide um, is the Quartar CADAP technical network. So, we are saying these, um, yes, they are building from the previous experiences, uh, but they are new institutional mechanisms that we want to use to provide technical support to the different implementing um, agencies, basically the regional economic community and specifically the, the, the different um, countries. And the capacity we are talking about is in terms of providing tools, analytical tools, developing systems, providing knowledge and technical analysis to inform design, implementation, review, and dialogue. And we're also saying these technical networks, um, basically, you, you can say they are groups of individuals and institutions that are willing to come together and have expertise and track record on working on specific issues on the continent. Okay? And they are clear organizing entities uh, to be able to um, provide that support. And they are open to individuals, institutions, and institutions uh, that are interested in supporting the AU and the member states uh, to improve capacity uh, towards um, impact, results and impact. Um, at the moment, 
Um, so the next slide says features of uh, CADAP technical network. The seven technical networks have been designed largely around the seven Malabo um, uh, uh, commitments. So you could almost see it's almost a one-to-one -one mapping of these technical networks. In the next slide, I'll, uh, I'll give you the specific name of those technical networks. And like I said, they are meant to provide capacity to, the, uh, to improve the, the pace and uh, accelerate implementation of the Malabo uh, declaration. And the, these uh, technical networks will be supporting um, implementation at national and regional level um, uh, to improve the, the, the chances of, 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 and the quality of the different national investment plans. One key principle of that is um, that there will be demand driven, uh, meaning that what they do at regional level or country level will be based on the needs of the country. So it, it is the country that will be writing the technical network asking for support in specific areas um, where they need uh, support. The next slide says, what will kind of technical network do? And we are giving examples of support areas. Um, and we are saying one um, thing that they would do is um, collating and sharing best practices. Um, so these net, they do have existing knowledge within them. They have the ability to collect information from elsewhere, package it, and make it available to, um, to the, the, the users, member states or regional economic communities. They will also be able to provide targeted tra training and capacity building on specific areas depending on the demand that the country has. Um, again, the point here I'm, I'm making is what the technical networks do is going to depend on the needs that have been identified by um, member states or regional economic communities. Uh, the next slide says the seven CADAP technical networks. So these are the seven technical networks. Like I said, they are linked largely, almost directly to the, um, the seven Malabo commitments. The first one is on across investment financing. The second is on food security and nutrition, agricultural research and extension, agro-industry and value chain development, markets and regional trade, resilience, risk management, and natural resource management. And the last one is on knowledge management, policy analysis, and accountability for results. So those are your seven second networks that have so far um, been uh, formed. I should also have said that these second networks were launched um, the first week of September last year in Nairobi. So what we are talking about here is not a myth, it's not a theory, it is a practice that is evolving, and we are looking forward to strengthening their formation, but more importantly, how they will operate to support member states. So the next slide uh, says, uh, talks about exactly that, operational issues, how will technical networks work. The first thing we are saying, each technical network has a convening organization. In other words, these are self-organizing um, networks they will choose among themselves one institution or organization that will act as a secretariat. And it will be responsible for coordinating the work of that uh, second network. Uh, secondly, um, we expect the second network to operate autonomously, but they will be coordinated by the AUC, the, specifically uh, the Department of Rural Economy and Agriculture in conjunction with um, the NEPAC agency to make sure that the activities of those second networks are aligned to the CADAP agenda as articulated within the Malabo Declaration. But um, the second network um, will be receiving demand, and I, as I said, they are going to be demand driven. And so the demand will be expressed from the member states in different, either through emails, letters, 
through websites, different um, frameworks are going to be designed to be able to capture or have a mechanism through which um, the demands or needs of a member state are expressed. And then the, once the, the, the needs are known or the demands are received, the technical network will be um, liaising with the AUC to make sure the support that is required is provided is in, a, in a coordinated manner um, uh, and centrally uh, at the Department of the Economy and Agriculture. The next slide is um, about some underlying principles for success of these technical networks. Uh, in other words, what, what is this um, that should be observed to make sure these technical networks are successful in doing what they are created to do? So one is emphasizing that the right individuals from the right institutions have to be members of, uh, are the ones to be members of the technical network. So people that are called uh, have the right skills and qualifications within the, um, the willing institution. Secondly, um, there ought to be the right incentives in place for the individuals and organizations. In other words, what will keep people interested in providing support through this second network? We must have the, the incentives right. And also, within the second network, there should be gently agreed values, principles, and rules of engagement. How are the members of the second network going to work together? How do they deliver um, joint, a joint product to a country from their diverse backgrounds? Number four, they will need the right leadership. Um, how they select who will be the leader of that group will be important because it will determine uh, how they are coordinated, um, how they develop their agendas, and how they execute them. But for them to succeed, there must be commitment from the continental body. So the African Union Commission, and specifically this department, the Nepal Coordinating Agency, the Regional Economic Communities, and the Government Partners, we must show commitment to this second network for them to have the motivation and incentive uh, to support uh, the member states. But also they must be willing to adapt because the agenda is fluid. Yes, the objectives and principles of uh, Malabo will not change, but how the, the, the implement and also the policy environment might change and therefore we need to be adaptive. One thing that we emphasize and will not compromise on is having a quality, quality network because we believe that it is through delivering quality services to the country and having quality investment planning, do we have a chance of improving the quality of implementation as well as the, the quality of outcome? So the issue of quality is going to be something that we emphasize uh, um, a lot um, in, in the operations of the second network. But also we believe um, in having strong communication in what the, on what the what are the intentions of these second network to make them known across the continent, but also once they begin uh, doing work, communicating what they are doing and the outcomes of that, uh, both at country level, but also central at, at the African Union Commission to make sure that we popularize the work that is going on in the, uh, in the second network. And finally, focusing on deliverables. What is this? that the member states will benefit out of these uh, technical networks. So we need to make sure we are strengthening the capacity of, of, of AU member states to be able to analyze, to be able to uh, implement, to be able to review, but also in the process um, having um, African professional implementers um, gain access to new and cutting edge uh, tools and products to facilitate uh, their work as they implement their investment plan. But also, we, the next slide says evaluating technical networks. Um, and we are saying that each technical network uh, will develop its broad objectives and goals, but these must be linked eventually to the annual reporting system. I already mentioned the unique feature of the Malabar Declaration, which is the 
and 20 millimeter counter DC system. And so the work of the second connect work will eventually have to be embedded into the value reporting so that as we uh, report the um, AU member states every three years, the work of the second connect work has to be part of that process. But also regular review of the effectiveness of these uh, second connect work will be important. And it will be important to receive feedback from um, the users who are the AU member states and the regional economic communities. Are they finding value out of this second connect work? What is it that they think the second connect work can do to improve the services that they provide? What is going right? What is not uh, going well? And how can we um, uh, improve on that? Then we are also thinking that um, maybe once a year or twice a year, we can bring together these second connect work, um, the seven of them, in one place to talk about the experiences and share experiences and see um, also what they think uh, could be done uh, to improve the, the way they uh, support member states um, to improve their, their capacity. The next slide says financing um, uh, CADAP second network. So we have had a lot of thinking um, around how these um, second connect work can be financed. And it's not one model. It's going to be uh, multiple ways of looking at this. But first of all, we think um, second connect work, especially at the beginning, at the, the affirmative stage, they would need some core funds um, that would be drawn upon as they, meet, they try to meet the demands of uh, the member states, but also to try to demonstrate that they are adding value to the country process. So they need some core funds uh, for that to happen. Number two, um, that we also think the, there will be resources, or there are resources already existing within the members of those second connect networks. Uh, because uh, many of those institutions are ex already existing, they are operating, they are doing things, but through the second connect work, they are simply coming together to provide a common, a common, uh, a common good uh, to the member states. So, second co agencies, either within the network or outside the second connect network, can also be a source of financing uh, to, um, to these networks. But we also uh, are saying the second connect network themselves ought to be able to develop proposals along the thematic area that they are leading to seek financing of the activities that they are proposing to do. Because they will have a program of work, they will have three activities, and they can uh, 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 put these into proposals and seek funding. Then we think in the long term, once they have had a chance to demonstrate value to the member states, we think that internal resources can be mobilized. Countries do have resources that can be used to support the activities of these second connect work. But for that to happen, they must demonstrate that what they are doing is beneficial to the member states. So we think in the long run, maybe three, four years down the road, second connect work should be able to mobilize the resources internally uh, to finance specific activities. They could be studied. Um, that, that are required by member states, um, and they, they can be paid for uh, with domestic resources. So, what has been happening so far? I, I already, yes, I'm, I'm about to wrap up. Um, so far, this, we said the seven second connect works have been, um, uh, they are already formed. They were launched in September in, uh, in uh, uh, Nairobi, and so far, there are about 60 agencies uh, combined that have signed up to be members of the Second Connect Network. And there is a website there. You can see that website um, and you can check it out. Um, so, we, like I said, they are still in the formative stage. And there are different levels of evolution. And um, they are open for um, to, to have other members come on board. In other words, they see an recruitment process going on in different networks, um, creating space for other members to join. 
but also they are already uh, being uh, part of the implementation. And the one specific uh, technical network on, on knowledge management, policy analysis, and data accountability is already working with the AUC in support of the um, revision of the national investment plan, but also uh, preparation for the value review. So already um, we are seeing that they, they are getting formed, but also there is value in, in, in their functions and, and services that they are providing. Um, coming towards the end, the next slide says, how can you participate? Um, in other words, how can you get involved in this second network? One, um, technical agencies and knowledge institutions that have, have relevant skills and resources can join the second network. The government partners, especially for mobilizing resources and coordinating support. And just um, uh, talk will address this a little bit more specifically on how the government partners can get involved. Then the CADAP implementers, who are the member states, regional economic communities, uh, also can join the, these uh, technical networks. And we are saying the technical network, the next slide says technical uh, network membership, recruitment is still open. And we are saying one of the questions that can motivate you to, to become a member of the technical network is to say, do you share the CADAP vision? Um, you have the relevant technical capacity to provide. You have a good track record on working on similar issues in Africa or in other parts of the world. You have resources or a bit of mobilized resources. Are you willing to work under a common uh, framework with other network members? And you genuinely have um, presence in Africa. So if you can answer all these six questions or five out of them, then you qualify to be a member of the one of the technical network. The next slide says, um, and it is how you can join. And there are four ways of joining uh, the technical network. You can sign up at the end of um, this session. We have given you the address of the technical network. And there is a, a, a link um, on the survey monkey. You can follow that. Go to the website or email um, the, the contact person for this technical network, Betty, and her email address is on the screen. You can get in touch with her. Finally, um, we are sharing with you other kind of processes of interest. Um, towards the end of this month, we have a CADAP Partners Platform Meeting, which is an annual forum that brings together the CADAP constituencies will happen in Uganda. But there are also national workshops that are being organized to domesticate Malabo into national investment plans taking place in different countries. Um, then there are we are also involved in the biannual review exercises, training country level teams that will be responsible for producing the country reports, which we shall compile into the continental report to present the heads of state in January 2018. Finally, um, one of our other presenters who um, may have accidentally opened the speakers on your computer. So if you, um, not not Godfrey, but our other presenters. Um, Please remember to mute your phones and also mute the speakers on your computer so that we don't get any feedback. Thank you. And please go ahead again, Godfrey. Yes, thank you. And that is, I was making my last point that one other um, uh, process of interest is before the CADA uh, Partners Platform meeting, there's going to be an agricultural policy learning uh, event on, the, on May 29 and 30th, uh, pre CADA PP. Um, which will be a forum uh, to share lessons um, on and, uh, lessons uh, around uh, how to uh, create policy processes at country level that can drive effective implementation of the naive that we are supporting member states to uh, to revise. So with that, um, thank you so much for listening to me, and I'm going to hand over to Jess, uh, take on and talk about donors. Uh, development partners' role 
in supporting the um, other uh, second connect work. Thank you. Thank you, Godfrey. I know that we're getting short on time, and so I just want to provide a few comments. I, I was asked to actually provide a bit of perspective you know, from the point of a uh, development partner, a donor agency. And I really want to actually focus on the slide that is the seven CADAP technical networks are based on the Malabo commitment. And I want to actually bring a focus to that because that actually speaks to a great deal of the, the, the issues that are being tackled here. The complexity of the issues are truly significant. The complexity of the, the different types of issues that are being dealt with means that there is no single institution that can actually deal with all of these different kinds of issues and providing support across the many countries, regions, zones, you know, of Africa. And that, you know, so that the idea of a network, a technical network, is an, an innovation for being able to deal with what is, I think, you know, a truly challenging issue. And it is clear, really, from the, from the Malabo, uh, you know, declaration that, that Africa really has set up tremendously challenging goals and development objectives, and that embedded in the Malabo decision is the realization that Africa really must tackle not only yesterday's challenges of low productivity and today's burden of poverty and hunger, but solve for the future issues of sustained and poor improvement, growth, nutrition, and inclusive development. The, the Malabo Declaration is truly visionary and puts in front of Africa many great challenges you know, in covering this different territory. Really in this context, you know, the capacity challenge that you know, Godfrey has spoken to is not only one of building a cadre of, of, of a new generation of Africans to serve these needs, which is actually necessary, but it really points to the fact that it is equally important is how best to access and deploy capacity that now exists in centers of excellence across Africa and around the world to launch the performance of African agriculture needed to achieve Africa's aspirations. Technical networks, as I see it, are an institutional innovation to help respond to these truly strategic challenges. They are not a new institution or institutions, but rather need to be joined efforts or enterprises of existing agencies already committed to providing technical support, committed to alignment with Malabo and to, and to committed, uh, committed to coordination to improve quality and reach of these existing agencies and technical support. They can and need to be committed to technical excellence, increased efficiency in how technical services are provided, and to growing the pool of experts in Africa with the knowledge, tools, and drive to deliver. On a very practical level, why are the Malabo and the CADAP technical networks really needed? Well, as I see it, they're really needed because they, there are a lot of technical agencies that now exist that want to assist and contribute, but they don't know what the entry point is as part of the Malabo effort. The networks can provide an entry point. They're needed to improve quality, alignment, and coherence of technical support available to countries. They're needed because countries and regions are confronted with basic issues of shaping strategies, programs, policies, and partnerships to deliver on the Malabo commitment and don't have enough hands to produce the quality of efforts needed. They're needed to accelerate implementation and speed up the learning curve on what works and what are best practices. They're needed because the scale of services needed dwarfs the ability to meet it by any single institution, and they're needed to give donors new and better tools to align and deliver support. Let me actually turn to one of the questions that you know, I was asked to, to speak to is, is how will the technical network be funded? To make the idea of the technical networks viable, as Godfrey has outlined, they will need resources dedicated to the net, net technical network operation. There are many options to make resources available. A first step in moving forward is simply recognizing the diversity and complexity of the financing architecture that now exists to support the goals and targets of the Malabo agenda. 
the reality is that there is no single window for network financing. There are many windows. A role of the technical network is mobilizing resources, is to create a platform of the best centers of excellence have to offer and make a service delivery option available that is unique in the space of aligning with delivering on the level. They are needing to draw on the strengths of existing institutions in mobilizing finance. A good technical partner that now exists would not exist if it had no ability to mobilize resources. If the technical network need to actually draw on these, you know, these experiences and capacities. The question of many people is, is really will you know, the donors respond in this area. First, donors are one piece of the financing architecture. Domestic resources are by far the largest pool of financing available. Second, donors really want to be catalytic. They want to fill a strategic gap and need that can inherently lead, leverage larger sustainable change. The technical networks conceptually are well placed to play this role, closely linked <coughs> to the Malabo implementation infrastructure. We do not see the larger trends as we look at the larger landscape, right, with regard to support for this agenda, we do not see any reductions in support for this agenda in Africa. As long as this agenda is important to Africa and progress is being made, it will be important to the development community. And finally, I want to defend the role and contribution of donors on this agenda. Donors have been strong advocates for the development of coherent technical support systems for CADAP and Malabo. They have been very responsive, flexible, and generous in advancing this agenda. And they do have a lot to offer in advancing the thinking and how to make the innovation of technical networks work. Press them to engage, and no doubt they shall. With that, I really want to turn it over you know, to the next speaker. <coughs> Wonderful. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Oh, yep, Chris, we can hear you. That sounds great. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Godfrey Bahiwa. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Jeff, uh, you know, for those uh, you know, precursor presentations. It makes my job really easy uh, because my presentation will really focus on trying to give basically updates and highlights with regard to how a functioning technical network uh, works, what it is composed of, and uh, what, are the, what are its priority areas and also areas of intervention. So if we can move to the next slide. So our technical network, which is on agro-industry and value chain, has members as indicated on that slide. Uh, we, you know, when uh, Godfrey and Jeff were, presented, were presenting, they did talk about the importance of having experience on the continent, the importance of having resources to support work on the continent, uh, the, the importance of, of, of indicating capacity uh, in the particular area. So basically, these are the initial members, because indeed membership is still open. These are the initial members of the agro-industry and value chain technical network. First at the top, we have the Alliance for Green Revolution in Africa, AGRA, who are also our conveners. Uh, Alliance for Green Revolution in Africa does a lot of work virtually in every African country, in many agricultural value chains. So they are our, our conveners. And then we have Grow Africa, uh, and we have other members like the European Center for Development and Policy, uh, FARA, the Forum for Agricultural Research, the African Agricultural in Incubation Network, uh, the African Seed Trade Association, which is very important that we are thinking about the entire value chain. So, you know, it's good that we have membership of the African Seed Trade Association. We are hoping that we will also have membership uh, from other input providers, fertilizer providers, and so on on the continent. The Alliance for Commodity Trade in Eastern and Southern Africa is a member. Uh, the Markets and Matter, uh, Matters Program, uh, the African Agricultural Trade Foundation is a member. We are very proud of the membership of the International Food Policy Research Institute, uh, Cornell University, East African Grain Council, uh, and, and the new alliance. 
So basically what you can see there is a mix basically of private sector organizations, foundations, development organizations, but also knowledge institutions. Because everybody brings something to ensuring that we can have competitive, competitive agricultural value chains are on the continent. So that's the membership we have now. If we can move to the next slide, please. Yeah, so we have a slide on prospective members so far that we are talking to. Uh, we, we are talking activity with the World Fish Center. Here where I'm, I'm located in Lusaka, Zambia, we do have a very active, uh, very active World Fish Center office. Uh, and I've been talking with Dr. Sloan, uh, who is heading the office here, and his, his colleagues also from all over the world, to also bring to bear uh, the knowledge that they have uh, in, in the fish sector, in the fishery sector. This is a very, very important sector for many countries on the continent. So we, we are hoping that going forward they will be concluding their membership also uh, within, uh, within the agro industry and value chain technical network. Next slide. Next slide, please. So we have other contributing entities, uh, other stakeholders that we are actively talking to, sharing information, uh, cut up implementers and related organizations. Uh, we have been discussing uh, with the Catholic Relief uh, uh, Services. Uh, they, they do a lot of work on value chains in many African countries, so we are talking to them. Uh, we are talking with the women and resources for Eastern and Southern Africa. It's very, very important to ensure we do have gender balance in activities within value chains. Uh, the Pan-African Agribusiness and Agro-Industry Consortium also are contributing uh, contribution ideas in terms of how we can make uh, African agricultural value chains competitive. The East African Farmers Federation, one of the farm organizations, are actively contributing ideas, and the Pan-African Farmers Organization itself also. Uh, various UN agencies like the FAO, we have been talking with them particularly around the issues of ensuring that we are producing commodities of, of quality that can meet uh, requirements of the market. Next slide, please. So uh, as a team, as a group, as a technical network, uh, we have concluded uh, an issues paper to look at the various issues in agricultural value chains in Africa. And many of our members have also been attending uh, national agricultural investment plan meetings, the review meetings happening in various countries, uh, including also the regional investment review meetings are happening in various regions uh, of the African continent. And also, we have also been following the processes uh, that countries are using around preparing for the biennial review. So basically, this is about obtaining information uh, with regard to how the te technical network might intervene. We are ensuring that we are active with regard to the, to the various kind of processes ongoing, both in country as well at the regional levels, in the various regions of the continent. Next slide, please. Right. So this slide talks to issues of how, uh, you know, our technical network and indeed, you know, other technical networks technical networks might contribute to better processes or biannual review reporting and the NAIT processes in particular, the National Agricultural Investment Plan uh, processes. So basically, you know, our suggestions, and this is what we have been doing, is really at the in-country level to publicize our membership. Uh, to, we are very proud of those capacities that our members have, so it's important that we are publicizing those, those uh, capacities and also the mandate. Uh, the, that, that we have. Uh, we also seek, you know, to understand the weight of development partners in country. Uh, it is important that we understand and we are adding value as a technical network. Uh, we are also uh, looking to obtaining, you know, a calendar of all the key events. I think uh, Dr. Bahiwa talked about some of the key events in his uh, presentation are happening, uh, but also specifically for country levels to understand when they uh, national Agricultural Investment Plan reviews uh, will be undertaken, the Malabo domestication meetings, the biannual review meetings, uh, partner support meetings, and other relevant agricultural development activities in country. Uh, we also direct our inquiries to our colleagues at the African Union and NEPAD uh, in terms of, of dates and events 
key events that, are, that might be relevant for our technical network, but we expect also other technical networks will be doing the same thing. Um, and basically, we seek to understand uh, how the CADA processes are working in country, which country is working with Oh. Hi, everyone. It seems that we briefly lost Chris's audio. Uh, we cannot hear you, Chris. If you can hear us, um, please let us know or type in the chat box or try to call back in. Uh, well, it happens. Well, we so, but in the meantime, um, why don't we move ahead to Greenwell's remarks since we, we don't have a lot of time left. Um, Greenwell, if you'd like to jump in and then when you're finished, if, um, if Chris wants to finish his presentation, that will work. Uh, Greenwell, are you there? Can you unmute? Yeah, I'm there. Great, we can hear you. Good. Right, so uh, I will just be quick in the interest of time, but uh, the, the ne network that I'm going to present is the uh, Knowledge Management net, uh, Technical Network. So as Godfrey has already talked about, I think he has already made her, uh, my job kind of Simpler. This has introduced a lot of things already. Uh, the technical network, which is focusing on knowledge management, is like a collection of agencies as well as organizations and individuals that all want to provide technical support and capacity development to AU member states and other CADEP implementers. Uh, one of the aims is that it seeks to or provide and develop capacity. I mean, it seeks to analyze and respond to needs and gaps identified in the process of developing and revising the National Agricultural Investment Plans in pursuit of the Malabo, and also seeks to provide training and technical guidance to national and regional agriculture sector, sector government entities on policies, programs, and technical advice to national and regional agriculture sector uh, 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 regional sector agricultural government entities on policies, programs, and practices that can accelerate achievement of national and continental agricultural production. Now, the membership of this is, I mean, if, uh, if, uh, if we are going, I, I wish I had a presentation, a PowerPoint presentation here, but I think for some of you, you who might not know this, uh, it is worth saying that there are several of institutions that have already shown interest to this and they've become members, including the Africa Capacity Building Foundation, the East Africa Grain Council, the AGRA, Barefoot Foundation, FANAPAN, uh, and et cetera, et cetera, including the Regional Strategic Analysis and Knowledge Support Systems, uh, where, which I, I lead, and the, it's also the convener of this network. Now, in terms of what specifically we intend to do in this network, uh, I would say one of them is to identify and assess capacity gaps for uh, the benefit of the Malabo implementation, also to facilitate knowledge sharing and mutual learning between and among countries within the context of the biannual review processes. Uh, provision of technical and capacity development support to countries for priority setting, planning, and strengthening, policy formulation, analysis, implementation, and evaluation, as well as to support, uh, I mean, to provide support for priority setting, implementation, uh, etc., by governments. Now, the, obviously, the technical network, as we speak about it, it's kind of in the process of uh, taking shape. We say it has taken shape, but there's still more, many things that we have to bring aboard in order to provide more structure to it. Some of the ongoing work that we have mapped on the continent, which also maps very well with our goals as a network, include the biannual review processes that are going on, uh, led by the African Union and the NEPAD. Also, the work that we have done under the research 
pro, uh, program across the continent, including the uh, joint agricultural sector reviews, the work we're doing with the n uh, National Agricultural Investment Plan uh, and the Grow, with Grow Africa on tracking uh, government commitments as well as private sector commitments there, and the, as well as the capacity assessment re, uh, work that the Africa Capacity Building Foundation does, the work by AGRA, Action Aid, etc. We all see these uh, this as important in the constitution of this network on knowledge management. Um, in terms of what we are already doing, uh, I mean, some of the things that we have recently been involved in as a network, some of them include the uh, Malabo domestication processes. So as you know, in, the African Union has embarked on these processes across the continent, and the, wherever such meetings are taking place, members of our network, uh, members of the research and the International Food Policy Research Institute are uh, kind of making themselves available there to kind of present either some work or, or at least listen in to the country needs so that uh, after th those meetings when the country embarks on implementation or the design of the knives, we should always be there to try and provide technical support where feasible. And uh, we also have kind of participated in the biennial view regional trainings in East Africa, uh, which were two, one in Abidjan, the other one is an, was in Accra, and in East Africa, in Arusha, and just more recently, last week, in, here in Southern Africa, we had one in Johannesburg, and research, which convenes this, uh, leads this technical network, was also a lead trainer for all the countries that came there. And I think uh, the contribution there was kind of significant uh, from the kind of uh, comments from African Union as well as the uh, member states. One of the things that we think we look at as uh, a, a challenge as we try to gain more structure include obviously funding. And the, I was happy to see that Godfrey elaborated more in terms of how we envisage to finance this. So, so far, the funding has obviously been ad hoc, but we, we hope to kind of take advantage of the fact that we can write proposals to the development uh, partner community and see how to mobilize that. And indeed, if there are any uh, development partners or uh, stakeholders listening in who think they would do something about that, I think it would be very much appreciated as we go uh, for forward. Now, I need to emphasize that obviously in terms of the membership, the people and institutions that are there, we, I don't think it's enough. We need as many as possible with different capacities in terms of technical ability, finances, et cetera, et cetera, to come in. And if you are leading an institution that you think might become a member of this technical network on knowledge management, then it would be useful to co uh, get contact, uh, uh, I mean, to contact BT. The contact details are on the presentation that Dr. Ba Godfrey Bahigwa made. Uh, and the, that way, then, you, you could become a member if you s satisfy some of the criteria that uh, Dr. Bahigwa pointed out. Uh, I think with that, I would say that I can end my presentation there, but we have also produced some issues paper, which we can always share. And we're in the process of elaborating a strategy uh, that is going to guide us over uh, the, the medium to the, uh, the short to the medium term as well. Yeah, so with that, I think I can come to an end of this presentation. You might be back. All right, thank you so much to our presenters. Excellent. Um, we do have about 15 minutes for Q&A, and as you can see, a few of your questions have been answered uh, in the chat box by some of our, our representatives, uh, which is great. But we'll go ahead and run through a few of the questions um, that have come in uh, through the chat box. And so, um, this is a question that came in and I think uh, directly speaks to what you were just speaking of, Greenwell, um, and Godfrey might also be able to answer. But it came in from Merrill Jordan. With regard to the lessons learned and capacity gaps, et cetera, is CADAP looking to create or have you already created a learning network or some other 
sort of kind of active learning process um, to share these lessons learned. Greenwell or Godfrey, can you speak to that? Uh, this is Godfrey. Okay. Uh, I can start very quickly on that. So, um, as I may, as I said in my <coughs> my presentation, once these uh, Techno Connect works are up and running, we at the African Union Commission will have um, coordinators of the different Techno Connect works, and the role of those will be to link up with the different technical networks to coordinate the support that will be going to the member states. But because we know this is an evolving process, we are, we are also providing for a lesson learning uh, platform. Maybe uh, twice or once a year, we'll be bringing these technical networks together to share the lessons that they have learned as they are providing support to the member states. So that is the, the learning platform that we are planning to create once the technical networks are up and running. Over to you, Greenwell. Yeah, I don't think I have to add really much on, on that one, except also to say that so um, while we, uh, we don't have like a database of lessons learned to date, but I think in the course of providing technical support to various countries, across the African continent, we have always tried to kind of come up with some kind of uh, reports. And in those reports, there will be some strengths of, uh, in the, uh, that were identified in the process of, say, giving that kind of technical support. So I'll give an example of the biannual review training processes for countries in West Africa in Abidjan, Abidjan as well as in Accra. There were some things that were highlighted there, and we in order to ensure that we don't kind of uh, like uh, commit the same or, or at least come up with the same things or at least to confront the same things and fail to address them ab initio or immediately, we would always exchange those notes with the, the trainers in East Africa, the trainers in Southern Africa region to an extent that I, I'm able to say that the trainings that we heard with the uh, about 11 or 12 member states in the Southern Africa region last week benefited a lot from the lessons that we gathered from East Africa as well as in the West Africa region. And the, the same spirit is going to inform us as we move to ACAS uh, in Cameroon in, in, next week, I think, and then the same if we move to, uh, when we move to Egypt uh, in probably in around June. So yes, the lessons learned question is very critical and we're trying to do something about it. The hope is that as we forge into the future, we will be creating databases of some of these lessons, obviously conditional on uh, specific to the kind of trainings that we're offering, and then we can try to synthesize them so that should we want to do the same in future, we shouldn't be reinventing the wheel. We should be starting from somewhere. Yeah, thanks. Great, thank you so much. Uh, Godfrey, when you were speaking about nutrition, uh, a lot of questions came in. I think uh, naturally there is a lot of interest in nutrition and food security in terms of the participants who are on the line today. And um, so there were several questions that came in about linkages uh, with nutrition and food security implementers, key players and programs, and wanting to understand what that landscape looks like a bit more. Um, and also asking how much emphasis uh, will country members be putting on nutrition-sensitive agriculture to address food security? Would you mind elaborating a bit on the nutrition element? Yes, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Julie. Um, so first of all, the, there is a specific network on food security and nutrition. So that is bringing together different organizations that have expertise and experience in this area, okay? Um, now, the way we are in the supporting member states to integrate nutrition issues into their investment plans is through the naive revision I talked about, the revision or updating or formulating of new national agriculture investment plans. And so far, we have supported seven countries with initiating the process 
of revising and updating their national investment plans. These include Malawi, Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda, uh, Senegal, and so on. So he, for each of these countries, they develop a roadmap which they are going to follow to up to the time they have a new and revised um, investment plan. The way we provide technical support is that for each of the thematic areas, including food security and nutrition, there will be experts that will be going to those national workshops to address issues of nutrition at country level. So that is the initial uh, contact that we make uh, when we're uh, initiating the process at country level. But after that, following the roadmap that the country has developed itself, we, we are going to work with second institutions, including FAO, IFPRI, and others, to provide specific analytical support to each of the countries that are revising their investment plan to make sure that they have addressed the nutritional challenges that they are facing. Now, what type of uh, choices the country will make or the type of investments that will make to improve nutrition in the country will depend on what the needs are, okay? Whether or not they are going to be investing in processing uh, to add value to uh, consumable products, whether they are going to uh, invest in a, a, a crops that are nutrition sensitive will depend on, on the country. But what we are saying is that through the second connect work, we shall be available to provide the type of support that the country requires to identify the, um, uh, the strategies or investments that they need to address nutrition issues um, within their investment plan. What about you? All right, thank you so much. Um, Jeff, there was a question that came in that I think uh, you are best posed to answer. And that came in from David Dabrowski, uh, who asked or stated, donor landscapes are changing. What have been the commitments so far for funding the technical networks, and to what extent can these be said to be firm? Uh, I think he's just interested in a bit in how the changing donor landscapes are relating to the firmness of commitments to fund the CADA. Yes, I want to, you know, uh, first of all, you know, there is no particular, you know, separate uh, pool of money that is set aside that guarantees, you know, financial support, you know, and in-depth financial support for the networks over a longer period of time. You know, there is experience with each of the different networks that are working on it that they do have a track record of being able to, you know, mobilize resources. You know, and the response to those, in fact, have been, you know, pretty robust. The development agency, the donors, you know, fundamentally have been very much, you know, interested and involved in this issue from the time of developing pillar institutions and recognize the importance of being able to, in fact, make available high-quality technical services to assist countries and regions in being able to move forward and have been very concerned that this is one of the key issues that has been limiting the effective implementation, you know, of CADAP. So, you know, I can say that with, you know, uh, confidence that the, you know, donor community, you know, is, you know, both interested, you know, and, and well, both concerned and interested in the development of the infrastructure to support, you know, the different networks. And uh, so, uh, and, you know, there has been strong support historically, you know, from the donors on this and, uh, you know, uh, we, you know, uh, believe that if there is uh, a good quality, you know, effort coming forward, donors are going to be willing to have a look at it. But, but in terms of actually how firm are the commitments, you know, what we were going to be looking at are how, how firm are the proposals that are being prepared by the, you know, individual networks to actually ask for the strategic support consistent with what, uh, you know, uh, Godfrey has laid out. Thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, we had a question come in that I think is uh, best to be posed to Godfrey uh, from uh, Kopep Dabugat. And his question is, how will the support be provided to the member states? 
are there statutory processes thought out, or will the technical support be discretionary? What is the strategy? Yes, um, thank you, Kopet. <clears throat> the the are criteria that we are following to support member states with the revision of the of their national investment plan. One such criterion is the demand that is coming from the countries themselves. So a member state, a member state that knows that it investment plan is about to expire um, and would like to revise or formulate a new one, and they know that they are required to implement Malabo, the Malabo Declaration, they write to the African Union or to the Regional Economic Community or to the NEPAD agency and seek support of the African Union to revise or update their investment plan. Then our role is to mobilize this technical support that we are outlining. So at, at the moment, as we form or create this technical network, the support is in different forms. But eventually, once the technical networks are all up and running, again, it will be based on demand from the member states. And once we believe that once we have supported 10 or 15 uh, AU member states and they have quality and credible investment plan, there will be huge demand for the services of this technical network because each country will be wanting to um, also have a quality investment plan that they believe, uh, can, if, if well implemented, can lead them to achieving the goals and targets of the Malabo Declaration. So the biggest principle is demand from the member states themselves. Over to you. Thank you very much. And as you can see, we have put up a few polls before we wrap up the webinar. We still have five minutes or so for questions. Um, but a few polls to help us gauge uh, your experience with the webinar, some of your takeaways, and whether you plan to engage with the CADAP technical network. Uh, so please take a moment to take these polls. And uh, we also have a, we can answer a few more questions before we wrap up today. And so I wanted to check, uh, Chris, were you able to call back in? I don't hear you, Chris, in case you are on mute. Hmm. All right, it sounds like perhaps we uh, have not had Chris able to rejoin. Um, so I, I was going to ask him a question, but we'll hold that one, and we will do our best to answer any unanswered questions uh, via the AgriLinks website. So when we send you uh, the post-event email that will contain the recording and the transcript of this webinar, um, we'll also do our best to, um, to get all of your questions answered then as well. But in the meantime, a question came in uh, from Solomon Kalema, um, who is with the African Agribusiness Incubators Network, and wanted to clarify um, that water for agricultural production remains a major challenge in Africa today. Which component within the networks will be addressing water? Um, hmm. Yes. So. As you know, the, uh, okay. can you hear me? As you know, the issue of um, addressing the effects of climate change, especially drought, are uh, of paramount importance to very many of the aging member states, and especially the Horn of Africa and Southern Africa, which suffer from frequent uh, drought. As you know, 2016 was one such a year where crops failed animals died as a result of this. So the issue of um, addressing uh, water availability for agriculture is key. And we believe the technical network on, on, on building resilience will be the one that will be uh, providing that technical support to member states that are um, wanting to invest in technologies that have to deal with water conservation at, um, at farm level, uh, but also looking at uh, cost-effective uh, technologies for irrigation, especially for small-scale farmers, um, because large-scale investment 
in big scale uh, irrigation systems can be challenging and expensive, but it's going to be a combination of different um, technologies, uh, but cost effectiveness is going to be such a consideration. But that will be the technical network that will be responsible for providing that, that, that knowledge to them. Back to you. Maybe I can add the point there now that I am back. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, so yeah, basically uh, what I wanted to say in addition to what Godfrey was saying is that I think that under the new dispensation of technical networks, we have wide resources as opposed to previously when we were working only with what we call dealer institutions. So there is uh, a lot of knowledge, it's a, it's a wide knowledge base for the various issues that any kind of implementer uh, would be looking to address. Yeah. So I have seen, for example, the various questions that have been posted here around agro-industry and, and the challenges to do with trade and so on. Uh, we have enough institutions within, I think, within the network to address those queries. But also, it's an issue of working intra within among the networks, because we also have the network on trade and markets that works directly with regional economic communities. So I think that the added value of this new innovation is really the depth of the stakeholders we have brought to the table to provide support to the countries, to the regional economic communities, and to the implementers generally. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have time for just one final question that I'm going to, to send to Jeff. Um, and this question came in from Simbarashe Sabanda, who said that there are many initiatives in Africa that are expecting member states to fund activities, but I have misgivings about this materializing. What advocacy or mobilization initiatives are planned to ensure member states contribute? Yeah, so I, uh, you know, appreciate the comments and the concern. I do think that the, um, you know, the technical networks, you know, as has been laid out, I think, by, by Godfrey uh, and me, you know, will need some core resources to be able to provide some support that, you know, will not likely come from the countries and being able to, you know, ensure that they have the, the, the infrastructure to be able to, uh, to function, right? But what we do know is that, in fact, you know, over the first 10 years of CADAP, you know, in general, you know, uh, the uh, countries increased their financing, you know, support agriculture by 3% per, you know, on average. That is, that means, you know, that in fact, you know, during that period of time, that translates into over $300 million per country that they did come up with resources. So in terms of looking for something that countries are delivering on and saying they're, you know, they're spending money on, this is one of the areas that there is solid evidence that they are spending their resources to advance. And that they, and there is, there's no question that countries, you know, are actually investing in, in improving the quality of their decision making you know, and, you know, securing technical assistance to do that. The infrastructure that is being put on the table with regard to, you know, the technical network is really helping to actually, in, you know, improve the efficiency of that, improve some of the matchmaking in between what the country needs are and what some of the agencies, you know, uh, have to offer, you know, with the country. Um, uh, so, you know, I think that, I don't know that that, you know, provides it, you know, specific enough, but, you know, I don't know of any single country that, you know, hasn't actually invested in improving, you know, the knowledge base that they're making, whether it is on irrigation or whether it is on market access or whether it is, you know, on negotiating you know, policies on water between countries. They are spending their own money, you know, to actually better understand, you know, what the op op options are, you know, for them. Yeah. Maybe I can add the perspective to that issue of wanting countries to fund all these initiatives. And, and basically the perspective would be that 
actually there are a lot of resources also in country that are usually not used because there are no good plans because there's not good organization so I think you know the these initiatives you know the organization of CADAP the technical networks and so on will help to actually unlock some of those resources that are not used or are misused to ensure they are used more appropriately uh, on an agenda that, are, that is agreed to at the continental and national level. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. Well, we've come up on the end of our allotted time uh, for our webinar, and I, I don't want to keep anyone past our time, uh, but I want to extend a sincere thank you to our four presenters, Godfrey, Jeff, Chris, and Greenwell, for your very informative presentations. And um, also an even bigger thank you to our participants. Thank you for your excellent questions, uh, conversation in the chat box, and of course for supporting AgriLink's webinars. Um, one more time, I'll let you know that we did record this. We're going to send you the transcript, which can be a very useful read if you want to comb back over any particular portion of the webinar. And of course, the slides uh, are currently available on the event page on AgriLinks for this webinar. Uh, and we'll make sure that you have an email with all of these resources uh, within the next uh, two weeks. So uh, thank you very much for your participation in today's webinar. Uh, we're really thrilled to have you online. And we'll see you at, at future AgriLinks and Bureau for Food Security events. Thank you very much, and have a